And then they were like, there's no way any of this is true. So they went in and they checked this book and they had like a huge tribunal. They, they checked it. They, had, they went and found the prison guards. They checked dates against places and, and people that he said, everything checks out. You are a good reader, my friend. Yeah, I'm trying. My dyslexic ass can't read at half that speed. Yeah, I, f I forgot about that. You had to, because like if people haven't read your book, yeah. Mother of God, it's fucking incredible, number one. Thank you. Number two, you're an unbelievable writer. It's almost too good. It's almost like, all right, take it back a notch there, pal. Like you have, you have this, you have this huge, unbelievably descriptive vocabulary. Um, how did you learn how to do that if you grew up so dyslexic? My parents read to me every night. Wow. I literally couldn't read. I just, I remember the other kids. I remember like asking my friends to write things down. I remember being like, hey, could you, could you read me this? And like my friends would be like, yeah, yeah, that says this. And I, I remember being like 10. And it was very laborious. It was very difficult for me to read, to sit down and read. There'd be like homework assignments that I just couldn't do. And so my parents would be like, you know, read more. You're in trouble if you don't read. All that, all that stuff. They tried to incentivize reading. But when that didn't work, every night, regardless, they'd be reading us books. So the entire Lord of the Rings, mm. the Chronicles of Narnia, Jane Goodall, everything you could think of, they read wow. it. And they put in that time. And so writing is easy for me. The use of, of language from from listening but it's it comes in much better auditorily for me and so with mother of god i had to now again i send my editor uh a few chapters and they, they have they'll just it's just why it's funny watching somebody that's never worked with me before because they'll be like wait a second so you can construct this beautiful paragraph but you can't spell restaurant <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like what? and uh hey hey <laughs> that they think they think I'm fucking with them. They think I'm being lazy because yeah. I, I just I'll hand in I'll hand in what looks like messy writing, and that's just that's what I do. So what, even watching you read that, you are reading at 10x the speed that I can actually decipher those characters at. I'm much slower. Did, like that's the thing. My dad always he goes, "You blame everything on dyslexia," and I go, "No, it's real." Like there's wow, a reason. Like I can't. Still. People send me a spreadsheet, and I'm like, "Nope." I like call How my do friend. You, do, so do you literally your eyes? try to see it right to left mm, it's not it's not exactly backwards but i mean first of all if you I, I guess i guess would you have a would you have trouble spelling hippopotamus or is that easy spelling is hit or miss for me okay. sometimes i'm really good sometimes i'm like wow that was that was bad yeah, <laughs> yeah. no sometimes spell check can't figure out what i'm trying to do like i'll be like um, I'll, I'll have it written in my notebook but i'll spell it however i want to spell it and then i'll be like sitting there with my notebook trying to get this onto the page i mean i'm writing now so I'm sitting there doing this and spell check is like, we don't know what you're trying to say. Mm. Like, because my spelling is that far out. Like I'm yeah. just sounding out the word. Wow. Um, yeah. You would never know that reading that book just because the, yeah. the mastery of, of the language. I mean, once you could, it sounds like when you were young, like reading it all was, was a problem. Was but once tough. you actually could read yourself, did, did you do that a lot when you were maybe in high school? Or? Oh, yeah. And today, like I don't go anywhere without a book. Right. Anywhere. I know and that I mean, now, but... Yeah. I mean, the, in the jungle, in the airport, it doesn't matter where you are. It's like the book is the one thing, like you don't got to recharge it. Like it's... And they can't tell you to turn it off. Like it's just, you can always have a book. It's your best friend. I mean, I have a Kindle, so they can. Sure. They can. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, why I love what, my pages. What did you, besides the, you were telling me what your parents read you growing up, but what did you eventually get into once you started reading yourself? Like what types of things interest you? Okay. So there's a Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman movie called Papillon. Papillon. It says it's butterfly in French. I don't know that. Oh my God. Watch Steve this movie. Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman? Steve McQueen Hoffman? and Dustin it? Hoffman. It's the best movie you haven't seen. Uh, obviously. I haven't it's seen this, it. It's a true story. Uh, this guy, Henry Cherrier, I'm probably butchering his name, it's probably Henri Cherrier, but um, this guy, Henry Cherrier, uh, he gets, he's a safe cracker, but he gets accused of, of something worse. He gets accused of murder and they send him from France where he lives to French Guyana in South America. So they, mm. they shackle him, they put him on a ship and they send him to prison and they send him to one of those prisons that's like on an island, out in the jungle, there's no way you're ever getting out of there. And the whole book is him going, I have two goals. One is to not, he goes, even though I hate everybody, I hate the prisoners, I hate the system, I hate the fact that I was wrongfully convicted. He determines that he's not going to become an evil person. That's his first thing. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but in the situation he's in, you could just become a psycho killer because you'd be like, I hate everybody. And he decides he's going to escape. And the mm. whole book is him escaping. And it's 
bananas. The book is even better than the movie, but Steve McQueen, uh, it's worth Pretty it. Good stuff. It's worth it. I got to read the book yeah. too. And then at one point he escapes. And again, they they held like a huge tribunal because this book came out and it went mega global success. And then they were like, there's no way any of this is true. So they went in and they checked this book and they had like a huge tribunal. They they checked it. They had they went and found the prison guards. They checked dates against places and, and people that he said, everything checks out. They couldn't disprove mm. a single one of this guy's stories. And like one of his escapes, he lived on an island with a tribe where he was actually married to these two sisters for a while. And then after a while, he he escaped off of there. It was, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's absolutely incredible what this guy did and what he endured and kept being a good person. He mm. kept, he like, he didn't just turn and just go psycho, which like a lot of the prisoners around him were just becoming, oh, and then they put him in solitary confinement for two years. They put him in a box with That'll no- do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like crazy, crazy stuff. Do you still like to read a lot of fiction? Um, I like to read a lot of fiction. I like to read a lot of nonfiction. I try to, I try actually, I usually have both. It usually depends what mood I'm in. And yeah. so like, you know, usually like if I'm like traveling and moving around and stuff, like I'll just like be, be reading nonfiction. And then when I can like settle in, when I have a dog and a couch <laughs> or a hammock, then I can, then I can like get into a story. I started getting into fiction a little bit more because I've always read nonfiction, mm -hmm. right? I love nonfiction. I love learning about things and stuff, but I think it's really good, especially for a writer yeah. to constantly be reading people who have to paint the story from scratch Yeah, because there's just something so majestic and beautiful about that that you, you can't make up. Yes, and I love when nonfiction is written like fiction. Like when you mm. catch a nonfiction writer who's yes. writing beautiful prose. Yes. So the book, The Tiger, which I um, I got to get you a copy of this book. It's about this tiger that gets, that decides, it becomes a man-eating tiger in, in Siberia and starts hunting humans. Mm. And so the, 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 the tiger conservationists in the region realize they have to kill this tiger or as it is, it's going from cabin to cabin killing people. If they don't get this tiger and people realize there's a man-eating tiger, then it's going to spur everyone to go out and kill all the tigers. And they're already so, so endangered. And so to save the tigers, they have to kill this man-eating tiger. And it's mm. this insane hunt. And the writer does this amazing job of painting the ecosystem in this wild eastern edge of Africa, of, of Africa, of Russia. One of the best nonfiction books I've ever read. I got to read that. Absolutely incredible. Who wrote that? John Valiant or Valiant. I don't know how to say his last name. That, but that you sold me on that. Yeah. And and if you go look at the reviews, it's it's literally one of the best nonfiction books. They haven't ever made a movie out of that yet. I don't. Okay. I don't know how you would make a movie out of this book because the main character is a nine hundred pound tiger. Oh, so does he tell it through the eyes of the tiger itself at all? No, but with like if you watch a movie, there's a movie. I forget what the movie is. It's it's with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin, but they're in the wilderness and there's a bear fight where Anthony Hopkins fights a bear. And it's incredible because there's a real bear. It's Bart the Bear, that the same bear mm. that was in Legends of the Fall. It was in White Fang. It was, it's a harrowing bear fight. It's absolutely savage. And then when you cut to The Revenant, where you have a mm. digital bear, yeah, it's not, it's not the same. And so I don't know how you could carry a movie. Maybe you could make it like an adult animation or something. But to me, having a, having this you know, incredibly beautiful, gnarly environments of Russian Kamchatka and the rivers and the eagles and the snow leopards. And then you have like a computer animated tiger walking around. Like it's just, it's not going to work. I think one way they could do it, I haven't read the book, but I'm just thinking out loud here. One way they could do it is the, the drama of the unknown. Mm -hmm. Don't show it. Don't tell the story <sighs> through the eyes of the humans who witness it and the humans who are struggling with the back and forth of we kill this tiger mm -hmm. to save the rest. You could get away with that for a lot of it. And and I think, I don't know what the rules are on filming with animals, but you could definitely, because one of the, th some of the amazing things that this tiger does, because they say like it got shot. Mm. It doesn't kill a tiger that big. Um, really? Not, I mean. If you shoot it in the heart? I mean, if you shoot it in the heart, maybe, but like even a pretty large caliber to a 900 pound tiger, they could take that in the, in the shoulder. Oh, yeah. 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 And so- this tiger just realized humans were always the thing that were threatening it. So then, then it started hunting humans. But then it started realizing where do you find humans in their cabins, mm. and it would smell their because the bed smells like humans the most. So these people would be out in the remote wilderness. They'd go into their cabins, and there would be a tiger on the bed. Last thing they ever saw. <sighs> yep, 
gone. There's one, yo, in the beginning of the book, there's a scene where they're describing their tracking and they're looking for, they know this guy got eaten by a tiger because there's blood all over the snow. But they're looking at the tracks and the human tracks are running. You can see this. There's a big spread. The human tracks are running and then all of a sudden they just stop. Gone. Gone. Because the tiger hit him from the side and took him 18 feet Whoa. that way. It just like- What a way to go. As they're, as they're tracking him, you, you, you know, they bring you through that they're like, wait, the tracks end. And then they're looking, you know, 10 feet, 15 feet in either direction. They're like, there's nothing. It's just like in it's the like Da Vinci Code when the, when the cane <laughs> track. <laughs> <laughs> Have you run into anyone? That's an inside joke. Sorry, people. The last time Paul was in here, you were, go you were going off anything. about some of the people who are trying to reinvent the Amazon and claiming the whole thing's man-made and running with these headlines. And you, Danny Jones and me crack up over that line. You're like, I ask you, I'm like, why, why do you think they're doing this? And you're like, I don't know, because they think their life is the fucking Da Vinci Code. <laughs> uh, I got so mad. 